Hello everyone, John Atkinson again here doing another interview for the circumcision, quote, circumcision harms docu-series. And today I have a very special guest by the name of Ronald Goldman. He is a PhD, he is a psychologist and executive director of the Circumcision Resource Center in Boston, which is a nonprofit educational organization at circumcision.org. His groundbreaking investigation of the unacknowledged adverse psychological and social aspects of circumcision included hundreds of contacts with men, parents, Jews, and medical and mental health professionals. Dr. Goldman is the author of Circumcision, The Hidden Trauma, and <clears throat> Questioning Circumcision, A Jewish Perspective. I only have this one book. I don't have the other one. Uh, other writing has appeared in medical journals, newspapers, parenting publications, and textbooks. Dr. Goldman has participated in over 200 media interviews. He speaks on circumcision and provides consult consultations for parents and circumcised men. Dr. Goldman is also director of the Early Trauma Prevention Center. The center educates the public and professionals about the generally unrecognized origins and prevention of emotional and behavioral problems. This valuable information improves personal, social, and political experiences. His programs are presented to professional groups, universities, conferences, organizations, and others. You can check out his website at ronaldgoldmanphd.com. Thank you for joining me, Ron. This, this is great. I, I've been looking forward to this. I'm very happy that you you uh, were wanting to do this interview with me. I'm glad to join you. So, um, so as I was expressing um, in the introduction, is that uh, I'm putting together this docu series. It was originally going to just be like a documentary, but I just realized it's just so big. There's so much to to talk about, and your, your book kind of illustrates that. And uh, and uh, well, anyways, the, the reason why I decided I don't want to do it is because this, the materials that I've seen so far, the resources, uh, things like the American Circumcision documentary, for example, um, which is excellent, excellent. I love Brendan's um, work on that. Uh, it's, uh, I, I want to get more into that when I talk a little bit more about your book. But um, the, the, the thing that I see missing is the talk about how men are physically harmed by this practice. Uh, a lot of times I come across men saying, well, how is it bad though? Um, a lot of people, you know, a lot of men think of it as good that they're, you know, previously amputated or circumcised. Uh, and after lots of years of studying the thing myself and I demonstrate uh, the difference is a lot using this little tool right here that doesn't get me kicked off of YouTube and other things. <laughs> um, I, I go into a lot, I've, I've figured out a lot of the details about how it is physically damaging and how it does harm our sexuality and not just for the men, but also for um, our partners, whether, you know, whether it's um, heterosexual um, contact or, or um, homosexual contact as well. So, um, but with you, uh, since you're the psychologist, I'm very excited to cover the the um, the last sections that focus more on the psychological impacts and the impacts on relationships. And uh, so, anyways, um, I was I was going to I was saying how I love the documentary American Circumcision, and I, 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 I everyone just for everyone to know, um, I just finished reading this book. And I didn't start reading this book until fairly recently. I've been doing these interviews and I've been doing, you know, studying on this topic and everything um, well before I started reading this book. I kind of wish I would have gotten it sooner. But um, it, what I love about it, as well as the documentary, the American Circumcision documentary, is that, well, there's two things. One is it shows you both sides of the, of the arguments. On, on, you know, the, the sides also that, you know, argue for doing it as, or that it's okay to do it, as well as, you know, of course, the, the parts that have, show that it, it's harmful. And it steps you through it. Um, 
I, I've actually been involved in uh, in change, uh, large forms of change, uh, through most of my life. Honestly, uh, I, my my history is is a is a corporate IT guy, uh, computers. It started out with my parents actually um, running a small business and. And they were trying to manage their business with a typewriter and handwritten ledger and calculator and stuff like that. And I learned about computers and I was like, here we go, we can, you know, we can change, we make it so much easier and all that. But you know, like lots of things, it's not easy to change. My mom, she just she stepped out, out of the office and went to the kitchen and never returned back to the office again. <laughs> and I ended up taking over the office. And my dad, he's he's done his absolute best to learn about how to use computers and stuff like that. But it's it's not always easy for everyone, you know, especially if, if you don't grow up with it. And that continued throughout my career. I I uh, I went into corporations that were trying to go from one technology to the next. And uh, and you had some people that were so used to the old ways that it was really hard for them to change their paradigms in their heads about how things work in order to do the new technology and stuff like that. And I, I realized that you can't just, you can't say, okay, jump 10 yards. Most people are going to say, screw you. I can't do that. <laughs> but if you say, well, just jump one yard, they might do that. If you, you know, lay out some, some steps, some baby steps, one step after another for them, they'll take those steps and they'll eventually get to those 10 yards. Same thing when it comes to this topic, unfortunately. It, it seems really simple once you understand it. It's like, it's really easy. I mean, even in the last part of the book, it's like, it's really easy. Just stop doing it. Stop cutting children's genitals without a medical need. But because of cognitive dissonance and, and other things, you had to step people through it. And this book does an excellent job of doing that. Did I give you a great review there <laughs> on your book? <laughs> so, um, so all I want to do is I want to step through the the items on that uh, that I try to cover in this docu series, and um, I don't want to give away your book, Ron. Um, I want people to, to buy it, and, uh, and you can buy the book on circumcision.org and the um, in the publications, as well as some other things there. Um, but I'll, I'll just you know I'll, I'll let you decide how much you want to give away in, in this in, in this video series and maybe hopefully some people will see this uh, this video and maybe the subsequent um, series that I put together later and and decide well I want to I want to understand it more better and, and buy the book. So the first section I have under psychological is trauma from the cut. And uh, one of the things you you do is the early um, early trauma prevention center, right? And uh, and and your book goes into things about um, trauma um, for childhood and and, and it, it, you know and birth and, and all that. And and it's not just, of course, it's not just on you know circumcision. There's other ways that uh, a person can be traumatized by by birth. You want to talk about that? Sure. Uh, simply put, trauma is an overwhelmingly painful experience. Uh, we human beings are designed to sense and respond to a certain range of experiences. And trauma exceeds that range. So when we're subjected to a traumatic experience, uh, we have to survive that somehow. Uh, and get on with our lives. And the way that happens is uh, psychologically, we withdraw and psychologists would say dissociate from this traumatic experience. And so what that does, it sort of screens out the experience, uh, both what we perceive and also uh, what our body uh, responds to or doesn't respond to. I mean, the other uh, term that applies here is repression. And what happens during repression is an experience and the associated feelings are set aside, so to speak, from our conscious awareness. And that's, that's what we may call our part of our defense mechanisms uh, to help us survive and move on from this traumatic experience. And it's a good thing we have these uh, ways of surviving through the traumas. Otherwise, it would 
much more severely affect our ability to function as human beings. So uh, what happens with this repression of the experience is it, it stays in the body. Uh, it has been said that body remembers what the mind forgets. So while we have, quote, forgotten about this experience of circumcision, uh, that the very strong emotions uh, are held in the body, repressed in the body, and they can be triggered at a future time. And uh, actually, th this happened to me personally. I, uh, decades ago, uh, I decided to be a client in body psychotherapy, uh, which, which is not the same thing as typically what is cognitive psychotherapy. Cognitive psychotherapy involves dialogue, uh, talking and understanding, uh, using, using your intellectual ability uh, to uh, receive information and make decisions about any changes you want to make in your life, hopefully that will improve it. Okay, but with the body remembering, the uh, early trauma, uh, it takes some persistence, uh, some facilitation uh, from a body psychotherapist to facilitate someone actually arriving at a place of being able to access, uh, rem not just remember uh, in, the in the mind, but also to re-experience and discharge these uh, early traumatic feelings. And it's, it's done in a gradual way because this is extreme what we're talking about here, a, a trauma such as circumcision. So it happens in a step-by-step -step process. And uh, I was able to do this uh, in the course of my own uh, therapy sessions. And at one session, I had a, an experience where I was tremendously fearful of what I didn't know was going to happen, but I was I was just feeling a lot of fear, and uh, eventually I got to the point where, uh, and I hadn't thought of, I hadn't thought about circumcision prior to this session. Where it wasn't something that was uh, on my mind, you know, in the past or the present at that time. But eventually I got to the point where I rec I said to myself, I think I'm being circumcised, you know, as I was experiencing this trauma. And when I exited the therapy room, I stopped and I said to myself, they're still doing this. And that was like my uh, awareness that uh, this isn't just about me. This is happening uh, hour after hour, day after day, year after year to American infants. And, you know, of course, as I research the subject, I learned a lot more of that, but that, that was the, the crack in the door opening uh, for me to get into this subject. Yeah. So and let me hold there if you had any comment or anything. Yeah. Tens of thousands. I mean, I did some math. It's like, you know, in the U.S., it's still like 3,000 boys yeah. a, a month, right? Or I mean, a day, I'm sorry, a day getting mm -hmm. cut. Um, but when you look at the whole world, um, you know, Middle East and, and uh, some other areas, <clears throat> Africa, children are being cut by tens of thousands every day so and uh, of course i'm including you know female circumcision or female genital, genital mutilation and that as well so, and then of course there's the the more rare but still occurs um intersex normalization surgeries um so yeah a, a lot of people will respond and say well the the baby doesn't remember it um, <laughs> well, you and I are living proof that, well, there's, there's memories, um, however they come out, whether doing what you did or what um, Brendan did, uh, some, um, uh, what, I can't remember what it's called, but he did some work where he, his energy went down there and, um, and you know, made him focus on the topic and that's what led him to mm -hmm. doing the documentary. Um, Jay Jason actually wrote a book, um, and he he shared his his story and how he figured out that 
the uh, nightmares that he regularly experienced all the way into adulthood um he figured out was due to being circumcised Mm -hmm. um and i i always had uh, up into my 20s i had this uh nightmare that would i would wake up in the middle of the night uh, sweating and all that where um where i was like i couldn't move um and something or someone was approaching me and i knew that that was going to whatever it was was going to hurt me so um it was kind of vague but i would it would happen very frequently throughout my childhood and, and into my 20s so uh i can uh speak a little bit more about the uh the traumatic effects uh of course there are sexual effects uh yeah but the the the, uh, the psychological effects are severe and go unnoticed i mean most people don't remember much about their early life before the ages of, for example, three to five years old. Mm-hmm. And occasionally I ask people, do, do you think your first three to five years of your life had any effect on you? You know, that's a, that's a provocative question. Yeah. We don't, generally people don't remember it. And so they, they don't remember how they, the quality of life they had and how that affects them now. So getting back to, circumcision as a trauma as i said previously in order to survive that uh, we have to uh, our defenses have to protect us against this overwhelmingly painful emotions so those defenses when they protect us against these overwhelmingly painful emotions they they also repress our ability to experience emotions in general. That is very serious. I mean, it's how we survive and we don't have any choice about it. This is the body's taken over here like, to get us you know, past this horrible experience. But the, the, it, it gets to the point where uh, the inability of, we're talking about circumcised men here, uh, Again, generally speaking, there's a whole range of res- responses here. But generally speaking, uh, circumcised men have some difficulty in experiencing their emotions. Mm-hmm. And it, it, like I say, it, it, it goes with the experience of being circumcised and other traumas. I and mean, we can talk about other traumas later. But getting back to circumcision, uh, we have some difficulty experiencing emotions. And, and, and this is how it affects our relationship with others. Mm-hmm. When, we, when we have difficulty feeling our own emotions, we have corresponding difficulty f- feeling other people's emotions. And that relates to empathy. Yeah. And uh, to a large degree in this culture, which is the only one I know uh, <laughs> by large experience, we have difficulty with empathy. I mean, the news on the night every night is, is so horrendous. Mm-hmm. The, the, the national news about what's going on, and uh, but that that difficulty with empathy is uh, is very it, it's it's a barrier for us to have intimate relationships with other people. Yeah. So uh, and in in a larger context here. Uh, I strongly recommend that we do the best we, we're all doing the best we can, Mm -hmm. let me say, circumcised or otherwise. We're doing the best we can considering our personal histories and experiences. So this, this is, this is no place to be judging other people or or criticizing other people. Uh, What we need here is compassion for ourselves and each other. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and, and your your book, one of the things that says right there at the beginning, it says how an American cultural practice affects infants and ultimately us all. And that's that's part of what, you know, led me into doing this is like I, I kept seeing how this doesn't just affect, you know, those those that have been cut, but and and or and our sexual partners, but everyone, everyone. Is, um, 
and your book, uh, you, you're not just saying this stuff. Your book actually references uh, studies that have been done, and and like one, it's like one third of your book, it's like that much of your book is just references to yeah. other materials and right. uh, and and you relate to other people's um work that's been done yep. this isn't just your work it's oh, yeah. a compilation of lots of people's work so uh, that, this clearly took you a lot of um effort to put together um and lots of study i'm sure and research so i i applaud the work i i feel passionate about this uh, again about circumcision and about unnecessary infant traumas and just briefly, uh, you mentioned birth uh, quickly uh, earlier on. Uh, birth in this country is very often traumatic. Yeah. And about 99% of American births are done in hospitals. Uh, and that typically involves the mother giving up control of her birth experience yeah. to the doctor. Yeah. And so the doctor in, in various ways will say, uh, I think you need to do this or that. And, uh, and if the mother questions it, the doctor will say, well, if you don't do this, then there's a, a significant risk of some negative thing happening to you or your child. So that obviously triggers fear for the mother and more likely than not, she will accept the doctor's recommendation. And so, and this is what they're trained to do in medical school. Uh, they're trained to do things. They're not trained to just stand there and watch the birth. I mean, that wouldn't justify the fee they get, uh, among other things. So anyway, they, they have their training. Yeah. And what happens is their one intervention very often leads to another intervention, leads to another intervention. And that, this is a natural process now. Birth is yeah. natural. Yeah. Okay, but it gets interfered with. Uh, unnecessarily, not all the time, but a lot of the time, more, more than necessary. Yeah. And so there's a cascade effect of these interventions. And uh, here's a significant uh, piece of information in this country. Well, let me go back first in history. In the 1960s, the percentage of cesarean births in this country was four and a half percent. It is now one out of three births. Wow. Wow. And that, that's surgery, major yeah. surgery to get the baby out. One out of three. So uh, a big scar on women. It's we need, uh, I mean, this is something I, I learned a long time ago. Question everything. Yeah, absolutely. Particularly cultural beliefs, assumptions, and practices. Yeah. Question everything. Now, yeah. Let me say a little more about that. There's a risk to doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, because human beings are designed to be social beings. And by being social, we want to get acceptance and approval of other human beings. Mm -hmm. Social approval. It's, it's natural to want, to want that. OK, so if you question something that most other people accept as Hey, that's fine. Everybody does that. What's the problem? You know? If you question it, you're likely to get, uh, if you communicate that with other people, some social disapproval. Mm -hmm. And that awesome. triggers some fear in a lot of people because yep. we want social approval. We need social connection. Yeah. So to avoid the social disapproval, we go along and suppress something that we're not comfortable with about what we're going on with. Yeah. Okay. So again, again a, a long time ago, I learned a powerful lesson that when I suppressed my instinct and impulse and conformed to the people around me, I, I did not have peace of mind. I, I, I did not and have- There's war inside of you, right? Right. I, I did not have my personal integrity. Yeah. Okay. So that, that's an internal conflict uh, that I found very uh, distracting. 
And I, I had a major in incident about this. And after that incident, I said to myself, I'm questioning everything and I'm gonna speak my truth. So uh, there, are, there are risks with that. Yeah. Okay, but, but in my personal experience, the greater risk was losing my integrity and losing my peace of mind. Yeah, yeah, I, I totally with you there. I, I was, my, my, my conversion time when that happened for me was at the beginning of 2018, so just a few years ago. Yeah. Oh, so, yeah. I, I totally relate to you there. Yeah. Um. Oh. So, uh, we we're talking about birth and hospitals and stuff like that. And originally, my wife was going to birth our first son in hospital. Um. And uh, this is kind of what led to our antagonism, but, um, she she was asked by the OB, you know, whether to circumcise or not. And they were also talking about, you know, um, natural birth versus, you know, drug birth, mm -hmm. stuff like that. And um, and she got very uncomfortable with him because he, he kind of like patted her on the head and said, yeah, well, I'll be there ready to, you know, give you the drugs whenever you're, <laughs> when you're, when you're screaming your head off. Um, and she was like, no, that's not okay. And so she changed to a midwife and that's, uh, the midwife is the person that gave us information on the topic. So that's what led us to this thing. Now we, um, both of our boys were born at home, and after seeing how things work, it, it really makes sense to me why um, why hospital births lead to cesareans uh, quite often. It's it's a psychological thing um, because you know everything goes on in our body is is a function of what goes on in our head. <laughs> You, you start getting sweaty or, or having certain feelings or, or whatever. And physically, it's probably because of, a, of, a, of an emotional feeling that's going on in your head. Uh, my, my previous, my first wife uh, got a degree in um, behavioral health and I, I kind of got, to, I had to, I was kind of dragged through the whole studying process with her. But yeah, it, it's just, it's become very clear that it's, you know, it's a, very much attached. And, uh, I, I just kind of compare it with the idea of like sitting on the toilet trying to, you know, have a bowel movement and having, you know, several people around you saying, push, push, push. It's like, that's probably going to have the opposite effect of what you want the person to do. Right? So the person needs to be comfortable, relaxed and, and um, all that. So, mm -hmm. um, Let me say a little bit more about uh, medical doctors here. Mm -hmm. uh, as I just mentioned, you know, we, we have a, a tendency to want to conform and to be and have social acceptance. Okay, so think about medical doctors in training. They want the approval of their superiors to get their uh, degrees and and uh, and have a stable relationship with with the superiors. And so uh, if, if they're questioning something that they're taught, it's very difficult for them to raise that question with their teachers. It, it's risky. Yeah, yeah, uh, yep. Uh, let me try to remember a quote I, I, I uh, re remember reading in a, in a book about medical culture. And this, this is a man who was trained to be a doctor went through the training and he said something like uh, medical doctors are uh, avoid feelings uh, because they, they believe that avoidance of feelings means you're smart. <laughs> well, I, I think that helps. I, I can, I can see a certain, degree of, of value in, in separating your feelings from logic um, because it helps you focus on doing your job and getting a job done and, and not being distracted by your feelings. Um, but there's other side of that. So just, just like you were saying. Here's, here's the thing, something that doctors don't realize is that uh, when you avoid your feelings, your thoughts are affected. Yeah. So sure. uh, there's, there's a lot to think about with that. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know.
Yeah. So let's value our feelings. Yeah. And share them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I don't really have a whole lot else to discuss about or any more thoughts about the trauma from the cut itself. Yeah. Um, so the next section is about the trauma from the discoveries of the loss of the harm. Um, and I know that you've worked with many, many, even referenced some of them, and I even know <laughs> some of them that, you, that you've, uh, you've worked with. Um, uh, you know, these men that have figured out or have uh, started figuring out the ways that they're harmed by the fact that they're missing their prep use and um and why that means sexually for them and, and stuff like that Excuse and me. Uh, yeah i, I just want to mention another uh, very significant effect here okay on trauma mm -hmm. uh and certainly for circumcision uh the primary relationship for all of us is with our mothers okay, okay. Uh, th this is obviously we develop inside our mothers. Yeah. Uh, there's research that supports that uh, late, later stages of development, the fetus uh, listens, he hears the mother's voice, is sensitive to her emotions mm -hmm. and her experience. So uh, certainly with circumcision, uh, this is, a, this is a violation of the infant's need uh, to be protected yeah. by the mother, primarily. Okay, so what happens here is uh, it's, it sows significant seeds of distrust. Yeah. If you cannot trust your mother, who can you trust? I mean, yeah. this, is, this is unconsciously now, yeah. the baby. Yep. So the, the baby learns not to trust. Yep. And that's, that's a very fearful place to be for a newborn infant. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So yep. It, it, it involves more repression of feelings. Yeah. And uh, there's a, a term in the psychological literature called attachment. And there's been decades of studies that uh, display... Uh, different types of attachment uh, or, or the relationship of the bond between the infant and the mother. And generally speaking, uh, infants can have a secure attachment with the mother or an insecure attachment with the mother. Mm -hmm. And if that, if that relationship or attachment is insecure, again, decades of studies show that this has essentially lifelong impact on the behavior of people who don't have uh, grow up with secure attachment of the mothers. Mm -hmm. So they have uh, repressed feelings. Uh, they don't feel secure around them. They, they don't trust. They have yeah. difficult. Again, this is general comments. There's, there's, you know, there's also a range of, of how people uh, survive these early experiences. But again, the research shows, generally speaking, uh, there's going to be uh, long-term effect on behavior. And uh, some of the extreme long-term effects are people are more likely to be violent, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, yeah. these are things that I, I wanna bring to public attention. So uh, when people are making significant decisions, uh, they're aware of more, more of the uh, potential effects than what common culture is aware of. Yeah, you, you reference it in your book, but I've seen it in other um, articles and stuff like that. And my, my wife, my current wife, being one that has studied birth uh, to become a doula, and all that, uh, you, like skin to skin contact is really, really important. And, you yeah. know, I, I think in your book, you mentioned that, you know, the baby is at least in the hunter gatherer um, periods, the baby would stay with mom like really, really close for like the first yeah. year. Yeah. Um, so uh, That's having. Important having the baby taken away for it to have part of it cut off um, definitely would, it just makes obvious sense to me that that would disrupt that bond. Let me just mention here, it reminds me that a large percentage, in a large percentage of American hospitals, uh, after the birth, the infant is placed in a nursery, another room, 
Yeah, and pass the box. Separate from the mother. <laughs> yeah. It, yeah. Uh, yeah. And back, I think starting in the 70s, some mothers started to complain about this and said, oh, I want my baby with me. And so there's a split now. Some hospitals allow what they call rooming in, having the newborn infant stay with the mother and other hospitals still continue their traditional uh, separation of having these newborn infants in nurseries where they're, they're lying alone, uh, largely motionless, and uh, again, this is, this is having more negative effect on their ability to connect with the mother and express their feelings. Yeah. So, uh, and uh, it also, you know, moving a little step further regarding the separation of mothers and infants, again, common American cultural practice. Uh, I think we're one of the only countries in the world that uh, places are infants in separate beds in separate rooms yeah. uh, I mean, think of how lonely that is for the infant oh yeah it's, uh, unnatural, it, it, unnatural, <laughs> does not satisfy the infant's needs does uh, not support the relationship between the mother and the infant I mean, it, how many can you get to me right? what it, what it seems like is that what what we've been trying what people have been trying to do in the u.s is replicate what the efficiencies that have been found in factories into hospitals <laughs> like factories you're building building machines you're not building people <laughs> so <clears throat> yeah anyways i can really go off on that topic i i ask people to keep these principles in mind in making choices about infant care is it natural uh, does it satisfy the infant's needs and does it support the relationship between the infant and the mother? Yeah. And if it doesn't do any one of those, then it's time to question whether to make that choice. Yeah. Some people I'll get into debate with about this and they'll say, well, you're appealing to nature. It's like, I think nature knows better than us <laughs> still. <laughs> so I'm going to go with nature. All right. Okay, um, so we kind of jumped ahead into the mother-child bond and the child-parent trust, but um, yeah. yeah, that's okay, I'll, um, I can clip it up. Um, so again, trauma from the discoveries of the lost arm, the, the men, and I've, I've, since I've been talking about this issue and asking men about this issue and stuff for, you know, the past 16 years now, um, I've, I've seen this trauma, you know, lived out and with other men. Um, you know, I've attended uh, NORM meetings, National Organization of Restoring Men, and I've had lots of one-on-one uh, conversations with men that, you know, were figuring it out and learning about it and all that. And, and it's, the trauma is, is very real. It's, um, you know, you, you talk about PTSD for the, you know, the infant and all, but it's, it's like getting PTSD again. Uh, um, as as you're figuring out, you know how this is done to you, and and um, and then when you try to talk to other people about it that are you know steeped in their own kind of dissonance or your parents or whatever, and they they kind of deny you or whatever, that just makes the trauma even worse. Yeah, well, it we're talking about becoming aware of the original trauma, uh, and. Uh, Obviously, it's it's very disruptive emotionally because this is something, you know, again, it, satisfying the definition of trauma, too, too overwhelming and extreme to to experience directly. And uh, I think what's important here, and and for men talking about their feelings about circumcision, is the opportunity to connect with other men who can empathize with your feelings. To, to keep it uh, hidden inside yeah. is to maintain uh, that emotional separation uh, from other men with something that you, you possibly feel very strongly about or, or maybe your attempts at communication were getting rejected by friends, other friends and family. Um, but to, you know, to go to a meeting of men who 
uh, you expect or have similar feelings and will be open to ex uh, accepting your feelings is an important way to get some kind of emotional support and connect and not be so secretive. Yeah. Uh, I, I do happen to uh, lead a, a support group online for circumcised men. And this is one of the benefits from that is again, uh, getting feedback, getting emotional support uh, okay. and ac accepting that these feelings are are, are true and you know, part of our histories. Now, the other part here is uh, it, can, it can be very disruptive emotionally. If you start talking about this, it can, it can start uh, stimulating even stronger emotions. And uh, you know, there's, a, there's a choice here about uh, going further emotionally or, or sort of creating a set point of uh, that's as far as I'm comfortable going right now or I want to go. Yeah. Um, so getting back to body psychotherapy, uh, in, in a session with that, if you're feeling deep emotions uh, or the beginnings of something you know, trauma related, you're, you're in an environment with a therapist or a facilitator of some kind, someone who will support and encourage the person to express the feelings. And uh, it, it can be said that what really hurts us is holding on to our feelings rather than expressing them. Uh, it's, it, it's, it's a su sometimes surprising experience. No matter how painful your feeling is, if you release it and let it out, there, there's a sense of feeling good about discharging something that's been held back in your body for decades. It's, it's a step forward in your emotional progress to be able to release it. But again, it, it, it's very important to have support. You know, once you have a number of sessions with, with a facilitator, then you can reach a point where you can, uh, for example, if you have a, a room where you're comfortable, uh, not going to um, disturb other people in your, in your home or, mm -hmm. or nearby, if, if, you, if that's not going to be a distraction for you, then you can actually uh, get to a point where you can discharge these feelings, you know, in, in private by yourself. So uh, it, again, it's a step-by-step -step process. And uh, I found it very useful uh, to be able to, you know, proceed from the facilitated sessions to my own uh, private sessions. And uh, I'm, I'm very thankful that I have been able to discharge a lot of these feelings, get them out of my body. And that helps, helps me be more present with myself and with others. Definitely. Yeah, one of uh, the very first uh, meeting I went to in person with uh, Norm in Los Angeles, uh, I, I was I, I was able to release a, a lot of frustration because I felt so safe amongst other men that were not happy, too. So, it was very therapeutic for me. Mm -hmm. Good. So, um, and as we know, sometimes the all this trauma leads to suicide. Yeah, it's very, very sad, very unfortunate. It's just not common, but uh, I'm just very sad that that, that is an outcome. Uh, and unfortunately, it's, it's probably the, a contributing factor is they don't realize that there is support available for them. It's a matter of knowing how to find it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and there's a psychological impact to children. And you know, there's, uh, if you don't mind me sharing, there's one story uh, in there that uh, mentioned, and I actually tweeted about this, a three-year-old boy that actually remembered his birth. Um, and he told his mom how, his, how doctors shouldn't have scissors. <laughs> I thought it was cute as heck, but at the same time, I was like, I felt horribly sad for him. 
But uh, the reality is, is, is children, I, even my own children who are not cut, I, I worry about them um, because they are growing up knowing this. They, they hear mom and dad often talk about this with other people and see us wearing, you know, shirts like this, knowing that, you know, this, this horrible thing is going on in our own culture. How old are your children? Uh, 14 and 15. The 15 year old is almost 16. Okay. Well, let, let me mention a little anecdote here. Uh, in as part of my research for my book, I remember speaking to a, a young boy. He might have been around six or seven, who was not cut. And uh, at that time, he was saying that he was the only one in his class, you know, or going into the boys' locker room or whatever, who was who was not cut. And uh, the assumption is, well, it's not just an assumption; it's an experience that uh, some boys who are in that situation start to wonder about themselves if they're the only one yeah. who's not cut. Okay, but that didn't happen to this boy. And the reason is, uh, a couple of years earlier, he had a conversation which his mother initiated about uh, circumcision. And she explained to him in simple terms that he can understand why uh, she didn't want him to be circumcised. And when he heard what circumcision was, you know, cutting off this part of the penis, I mean, he, he was in his own uh, childlike way, was very surprised and uh, maybe even a little horrified that, wow, they did that to other boys. And he was glad that it wasn't done to him. And, and so that was, again, his earlier experience. So then when he got to the uh, situation where he saw all these other boys, peer boys now in his own grade, who had been circumcised, he felt sorry for all the other boys rather than feeling like uh, there's something wrong with me. He knew there's nothing wrong with him. There's something yeah. wrong with him. Yeah. So that's it. That's a little anecdote that uh, people can keep in mind. Uh, it's important because these boys are going to have exposure. Very likely. Uh, Ron, we lost your voice, your audio. I don't. Oh, there you are. Now you're back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that that's something for, for parents to be to keep in mind uh, yeah. that they, if they talk about it then their boys will be fine, regardless of their experience with other boys. Yeah. Yep. And Jennifer and I, particularly me, I do have conversations with them. In fact, I have one recording that uh, I, actually two, one, one on YouTube where I actually explained to both my sons a couple, almost a year ago, a year and a half ago, exactly what it is and, and, all, and the reasons why people, you know, um, give excuses for doing it and all that so um, did, did they uh, ever express any appreciation for the choices you and your wife made oh yeah um both of them have even gone out and did protests with us <laughs> or particularly with me and, um and they both uh are somewhat involved on social media mm -hmm. in various ways um my oldest i was very proud he he he, he stood up for me saying I'm, I'm very proud that my dad is uh, is speaking out about this. Mm -hmm. yeah. Good. So, uh, yeah, I, uh, I, I often compare this with uh, Greta Thunberg, who um, I, I read her dad's story about her process um, where she started learning about the um, the environment, you know, the, the world weather and stuff like that. And uh, then she ended up at the UN speaking, but she actually went through a period of depression before she started protesting and, and uh, ended up at the UN. So, yeah. so uh, you, know, I, one, you know, one part of the parent wants to protect the child from the world, right? But at the same time, it's not necessarily a good thing to overprotect at the same time. Let me just mention a, a little piece of data here. Um, the United States is the only country in the world that circumcises most of its male infants for non-religious reasons and Aside from 
uh, the United States, Muslims, and Jews. The rest of the world, circumcision rate is about 5%. So that certainly numerically tells us uh, how much of a minority position we have here in this country. And yeah. again, it's we're, we're... <laughs> the compulsion to repeat trauma yeah. is, is one of the after effects of it. And so because uh, so many Americans were circumcised in the past, I think the peak was around 1970 with about 85% mm -hmm. circumcisions and now it's in the 50s. Yeah. Uh, but again, all those boys that were circumcised then uh, had a tendency to want to circumcise their sons unless, again, they, they came across the information from the movement or online or their, yeah. their wives uh, objected or whatever. Yeah. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very, un unfortunately, a very long process for this change. This is actually a, a, a little discussion on Twitter just I read it recently is, is whether the continuation of this in the US is self-selection bias or money. And a lot of people think, well, it's money because we're, we have a capitalistic healthcare system and, um, and these butchers get paid to do it. So of course, and as long as that money is there, it's gonna continue to happen. Um, it's, it appears that states um, in places where insurance has stopped covering it, that the, the rate has declined significantly. But I think that a certain amount of self-selection bias also keeps it going as well. Um, that, that reminds me, uh, I'm part of a, a unique uh, legal action right now in terms of challenging Medicaid circumcision. And as we know, Medicaid is government funding for medical services for the poor. And it's written in the regulations, both in the nationally and in state regulations that funds shall only be used for medically necessary services. Now that makes a lot of sense if we're gonna be spending government money for medical services, they should be medically necessary. And of course, uh, newborn infant circumcisions are not medically necessary. And uh, in many states in this country, uh, they're being paid for by Medicaid funding, uh, including Massachusetts, which is where I live. Yeah. So, uh, I have a couple of attorneys working with me. Uh, we uh, have been uh, getting donations on GoFundMe uh, to uh, support this historical legal action. Uh, the first hearing we had with a judge, uh, the judge uh, dismissed the motion on the part of the state. Uh, didn't, didn't, the, the state made a motion to dismiss the case. Yeah. Yeah. get the language right here yeah yeah <laughs> the judge denied the motion to dismiss the case so that's that's a good start it is it, that's really a big deal yeah so uh we, we have uh other other hearings that will be coming up uh and this will probably take months to resolve uh but you know we're in it for whatever it takes we're going to be there <laughs> the best we can that's, that's pretty exciting. If, if we happen to win, and if, if it's decided on the merits, we should win, because it's it, black and white in the regulations. Yep. Uh, if we win, then that becomes a precedent for any other state that pays for Medicaid circumcisions yeah. to take legal action uh, to, to stop it. Yep. So we've got a uh, really big, big decision coming up here. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, people are, are on the edge of their seats on, the, on, the, on that uh, case. So thanks for bringing that up. I totally yeah. forgot about that. That I thought of it. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that was uh, psychological effects on children. Uh, then there's uh, psychological effects on medical professionals. And, and as, as you and I both know, there's, there's several medical professionals out there that are um, against this practice. I mean, there's there's a whole website for <laughs> doctors opposing circumcision, and there's also nurses for the rights of the child. Uh, so yeah. there's there are several medical professionals out there that do think that this is not something that we should be doing. Yeah, children. Yeah, it, uh, I, I mean, I, I can 
I can understand the uh, the difficulty that doctors and training have because I mean sometimes these these doctors and trainings are are asked to do circumcisions and their training about circumcision is they observe somebody else doing one and then they're asked to, to do it themselves yeah. and again to to actually perform a circumcision to to be able to do that psychologically re, virtually requires that you tell yourself you, this is not harmful it's okay or the baby will get over it or you know whatever the the thoughts are in order to support doing this this horrible thing of uh, mutilation and traumatizing but that that's the way we human beings uh, you know get by with you know certain certain actions that uh, aren't to benefit of many of us yeah i actually met um here local uh a virologist um he when he was attending medical school he found out about a class that was going to teach people how to do the, the practice and he actually went and stood outside the door and protested <laughs> so, like, yeah, that's great but yeah i, I yeah i i just I feel bad for the medical professionals that you know feel like they don't have any choice but to work in these hospitals mm -hmm. um, or clinics where where it happens. Let me mention uh, another thought that comes up is that the research on circumcision, uh, for the most part, uh, if they're if they're American researchers, they they have a bias to defend circumcision. So the study gets designed by, and these are generally men who are circumcised. Mm -hmm. So the study gets designed seeking to have a, a potential benefit for the practice of circumcision. Yeah. So by design uh, and, and through bias, they'll come up with a result that they intended to when they start the research. Yeah. So again, unfortunately, if you go if you search through the medical literature or circumcision studies, you're going to see a lot of these studies. Um, but, uh, for the most part, uh, any potential benefit, and the word potential here is important, because when the baby is circumcised, there is, there's, there's, there's no problem being treated here. So the, the potential benefit is anywhere, even by the research, from one in 100 will get a potential benefit to one, again, round numbers now, one in a hundred to one in a hundred thousand yeah. in the case of penile cancer. Yeah. So for that tiny amount of potential benefit, potential again, mm -hmm. uh, all these other uh, males are getting no benefit. And of course, there's 100% receiving the harm. Yeah. So yeah. some of the, the, the Europeans, some of the, the Europe. And, you know, again, in the context here, which I'm sure you know, but uh, no national medical organization in the world recommends circumcision, even the American ones. The, our American ones uh, basically take a, a neutral attitude. They don't make a recommendation. Yeah. But over in Europe, there, there's, there's over a dozen uh, organizations of professionals that recommend against circumcision. Yeah, when it, when it comes down to it, it's it, you're, you're talking about amputating a body part for uh, preemptively amputating a body part to avoid potential issues with that body part later on in life. Yeah. Potential, right? yeah, yeah. which you could do for all sorts of body parts. Like, yeah. so the logic doesn't doesn't make sense to me. It's like, why are you cutting off a valuable body part? But that that's where you get people. It's like valuable. Wait a second, it's just an extra flap of skin, isn't it? Okay, that that reminds me. <laughs> I went to uh, a lecture by uh, a medical professional on circumcision uh, given at a local hospital here in Boston. Uh, and I went there with a particular intention, of course. Uh, so I listened and uh, he was a supporter of circumcision. Uh, and uh, at the end of the lecture, then he uh, invited questions from the audience. Okay, so here's my question. Uh, would you please tell us the functions of the foreskin? <laughs> he had no idea. Oh. <laughs> no idea. Uh, and, you know, there was, you know, maybe a couple hundred people in the audience. 
And this, this man was also uh, involved in marketing and selling his own circumcision instruments. Okay, and this man is also the so-called circumcision expert uh, of the World Health Organization. So he's quoted from time to time, well, the World Health Organization is in, is in support of this. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah. it's important to know that this guy has a, a financial incentive and also is, is, isn't even enough informed to know what the functions of the horse can have. So uh, there's a lot of uh, a lot of progress to be made here. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, and we have some big powers that, like you said, the WHO people. Yeah. You know, will reference WHO, CDC, and AAP all the time, and yeah. and uh, from my gather, the the other two get their information from the AAP, <laughs> and that's really really disturbing because AAP is it's a for-profit organization, really. Yeah. Get down to it. yeah, it's not a legislative body. It's not a government body. No. Okay. Um, okay. So the next psychological thing is on the parent, and this is where I'm going to let loose a little bit. Um, in your book, you reference men quite often uh, that you know get angry and th this has been even in a documentary the american Circumcision documentary men that just like get so freaking angry and that you know they want to go burn buildings and <laughs> kill people and stuff like that they, um because they're so angry about it I, I am not just angry about the fact that i'm cut i'm what makes me even more furious is that that ob did not offer any information informed consent yeah that that would have led because i was i was just i was trusting doctors at this point in time in my life that would have led to my child my child getting cut and that just infuriates crap out of me that that could have happened it just <laughs> just burns me so you know there's a psychological impact to particularly parents that have figured this out um so many regret parents out there i i uh i submitted a uh what do you call it a uh, a bill uh in the state of massachusetts to re to require true informed consent the circumcisions this is you know, at the state house now, the legislature. Uh, and there was a public hearing. I had my several minutes of, uh, uh, first I submit the, the, the draft of the bill and then there's a hearing and anybody can attend. Uh, there's a committee that hears the testimony. I had my uh, you know, chance to speak. And uh, then uh, as it turned out, uh, the committee did not approve my, and that it has to be approved by the committee before it goes to the legislature for, mm -hmm. for vote, the debate and vote. It wasn't okay. approved by the committee. Oh, what they, they do, what do they do? They call this thing, uh, set it aside to study. Uh -huh. <laughs> it, 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 it's a, a euphemism for declining or k killing the bill without wanting to be outright about it. Yeah. We'll, we'll study it. I, I call it stonewalling. <laughs> yeah, whatever. So, but, but the, the point was, uh, you know, those kinds of efforts, you know, over a period of time, you don't know if you don't try. Yeah, no, okay. I, that's great. And uh, obviously, I wrote up a, a page about it, which is uh, on the circumcision.org website. And, uh, you know, maybe it can uh, give other people uh, some thought about uh, doing something similar because uh, okay. you're not, they're not, obviously they're not providing informed consent. Yeah, I'll have to, I'll have to look for that on the website now um, because yeah. I, I, have, I have emailed some hospitals saying, hey, would you guys be willing to say, hand out this pamphlet from say your whole baby or from doctors opposing hearing decisions or something, would you be willing to hand this information out to, yeah. to uh, parents? But this, this this goes back all the way to Marilyn Milos and how she got fired. Um, 
providing information to parents about this topic upsets parents. Oh my gosh. Right. We're gonna upset parents, but we're not gonna worry about the child that's getting their you know parts cut off. <laughs> well, again, it's in some ways it's it's a compl complicated uh, psychological environment to do. I mean, again, we're talking about a trauma. Trauma gets uh, repressed, both individually and uh, culturally repressed. So, but by repression, it means we don't want to we don't want to get stirred up about the feelings connected with this, and so there's an avoidance of the factual information because that can stir up you know the father if the father's circumcised, he's going to get triggered emotionally by anything uh, that inhibits his likelihood. And there's a study about this: the likelihood of the father circumcised, he wants his son to be circumcised. Yeah. So, uh, the, you know, it's, it goes with the territory of, of the long-term effects of trauma. Yeah. Unfortunately, yeah. that's yeah. why we got what we got, you know, ongoing there. Yeah. But certainly, you know, there are, uh, if more people get involved, uh, the more people who get more involved, uh, you know, social, we have the tools, social media, yeah. internet. So I, I think we have to go a little more further than that because I I I don't imagine a lot of these um, directors of hospitals or yeah. medical professionals are even monitoring, uh, uh, you know, social media often enough. I mean, it's just, all of them are just too busy doing their jobs, you know, trying to heal people and, and help people. And that. Okay, so here's a, here's a couple of things. One is uh, we need mothers to be more assertive here. Regardless, I mean, certainly consider what the father has to say. But if the father uh, wants the circumcision, the mother has a responsibility to her child to protect that child from harm, yeah. to make sure it doesn't happen. So the other thing is communicate with anyone you know who may be a parent in the future. Friends, family, acquaintances, internet. Let people have time to consider this uh, you know, some for some people it may take months to be able to make make the shift from thinking circumcision is harmless to recognizing it's harmful. And and that friend might end up blocking you or cutting you off out of their life or whatever. But I think the bigger risk, the worse risk, is um, if the if that friend of yours finds out later on how horrible this is, and then they get mad at you for not telling you. <laughs> Or well, Matt, if you're not telling them, you know, about the bad things of this, so. Well, that's presuming that they think or believe that your friend knew about this and didn't didn't disclose it. Yeah, I think you even said it in your in your in your book at, near the end is that the bigger risk is not saying something. Yeah. Well, the other thing I suggest to people is, if they're having a conversation about this, ask this person, "Are you open to new information?" It puts it right up front. Are they going to uh, consider new information? Or if they hesitate more than two seconds to answer that question, uh, it suggests there's a doubt, doubtful uh, ability to be open-minded here. Yeah. The other thing is have them watch a video of a circumcision. Mm -hmm. And if they refuse to watch a video of a circumcision, then uh, as Marilyn Milo said, if, it, if, it's, if it's too upsetting for you to watch, it's too upsetting for the baby to experience. Yep. Good quote. Hey, right, so that's the psychological stuff on the parent. Um, then there's also psychological effects on the intact individuals, the people that didn't get cut, right? And you were referen referencing a boy that was uh, told by his mother um, two years prior before he was in the locker room. Um, and then he was he was confident with his yeah. his status and all that. And uh, but there are plenty of intact individuals I've, I've come across that were like, yeah, when I was a kid or a teenager or whatever, I kind of felt bad. I, I felt like um, I kind of felt ashamed or whatever um, for not having had that done to me, like my peers or whatever. Yeah. So. Well, that's. 
it's understandable as, as a possible outcome. And it, that, that can be changed and improved with the, the proper uh, you know, support and response. So yeah, another reason to keep um, elevating the or the awareness on this issue, which gets into the last uh, psychological effect, which is um, that of the intactivists or the advocates for genital autonomy. Um, I've I know so many people that have been in and out, and even in and out multiple times of this movement because they get burnt out or mm -hmm. or whatever. Or I, I even think uh, I've been, been kind of looking at this lately. I even think that like war, uh, this is a war of its own. We're not dealing with bullets here, <laughs> at least not yet, it's hard to know, but um, you know, people aren't getting shot at, but they're getting shot at verbally, right? Um, emotionally, they're being emotionally attacked on social media when, whenever they try to speak out for, to protect children and they, they get called pedos or whatever for you know, trying to protect children from, from harm. And it's like, well, I, I didn't choose a body part that's getting cut off, I just, want to protect children from getting harmed mm -hmm. but you know this constant barrage of you know of people that are dealing with their own cognitive dissonance will verbally attack the advocates for genital autonomy i understand that uh and uh again we're all doing the best we can given our personal histories uh, and experiences and to make the best use of your time uh, working on this issue, if if someone is, if someone is saying in so many words, "I'm not open to new information," yeah, move on to someone who is open to new information. Yeah, absolutely. It's a very simple choice. Don't waste your time on somebody who's not open to new information. Yeah, yeah, I I, I get that. It you know it should be easy to move on, but I don't know some. You know, people take things personally. <laughs> so um, so I, you know, I, I guess that's just more reason for um, for the advocates and, and tactivists to, to gather together every once in a while and support each other. And, and mm -hmm. um, one thing that I often say regularly is I am extremely thankful for intactivists because it saved me from cutting my own child. Yeah. So thank you to all of the advocates for general autonomy for speaking out because if if it wouldn't have been for someone to do that for me then i would be in a very different position today mm -hmm. Great. um so then the uh, next section is about relationships and we you know, kind of already covered a little bit about child parent trust um yeah you you believe based on you know studies and all that you talk about in your book um that it affects the trust of you know yeah it's like okay, I'm a little baby and I'm screaming and no one's doing anything about it and I'm getting harmed and I can't move and all that. Um, and that screaming didn't get me any resolve. No one attended to me when I was screaming. Um, what reason would I scream anymore? Right. But then there's also, I guess, the babies that um, they're very fussy later on too. But I think those babies that are very fussy later on are fussy because of the pain they're dealing with down there until they, until they, heal I, I put quotes around heal because i unless the prep use grows back it's, it's not really healed but <laughs> the the primary pain goes away well it goes away from consciousness if it was consciousness yeah i mean it, it still stays in the body again the, the body remembers what the mind forgets as yeah. i said yeah just mm -hmm. um, i mean i'm talking about like the physical like the the diaper isn't touching an open wound anymore in the in the glands being you know it's supposed to be covered up and everything i i it'd be interesting to under to figure out if there would be a study or whatever to find out how sensitive the glands is during infancy I mean, they're covering it up with like vaseline and stuff like that or other creams um to keep the the intermucosa of the of the gland of the of the um what's left of the prep use of the foreskin from growing back onto the glands but <clears throat> I mean, how sensitive is that? Is that well, glands at that you, time? You may recall that there was a sensitivity study where they the did sorrels. filament touches mm -hmm. uh, on various sections and areas yeah. of men who were circumcised and men who were not. Yeah, and they were able to uh, compare the sensitivity 
uh, yeah. statistically and and found that certainly circumcised men are missing a significant degree of their uh, yeah. natural penile sensitivity. Yeah, the sorrel study. Actually, they, they said the inner, I think the inner surface of the foreskin was determined to be the most sensitive part of the penis. Yeah, uh, around the pendulum is the, the absolute hot spot. But, um, but that, that was done on men, not, I don't know how they would be able to do it on babies. I, I don't, I'm just kind of wondering if it would be different for babies who just had had that exposed. I mean, when, when you look at a baby after it's been profusely amputated, the glands looks very different at that time than the glands of an adult. It's, it's very, very red. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like it's not supposed to be exposed. So it's, it's like cutting any other part of your body open and then sticking it out there in the open air. It's like, <laughs> that's just, that's the way I see it at least. It's like you're, you're, op you're, you're exposing something that's supposed to be internal, covered up. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Uh, there's the co-parenting side of this too. There's uh, the 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 one example I like to share often is uh, James and uh, Jessica Rigdon, who have been very public about the challenge that they uh, went through when they were butting heads about this because James wanted to get their son cut, and Jessica was absolutely totally against it, and she's a she's a nurse. So, um, and as I understand it, this has led to, you know, some relationships ending in divorce over the topic. So, hey guys, we can reduce divorce rates by not cutting children. How about that? <laughs> well, it's, I mean, it's a situation, as I said previously, uh, we need more assertiveness from the mothers because their, their emotional sensitivity to, to this circumcision practice and its potential effects uh, is, is more available to them than a circumcised man's sensitivity would be. Yeah. So he loses his penile sensitivity and he also loses some of his emotional sensitivity. Yeah. It's part, part of the protective process of surviving that early trauma. Yeah, yeah, that leads me to a thought. It's you know, I, I hate putting more weight on on um, women uh, as mothers. It's you know, they have a lot of responsibility as it is to not be able to rely on their their partners to get some support around this. is you know, It's sad. It's really sad that they uh, they can't. This depend. raises another basic question: Don't have children unless you have. <laughs> no, listen. I, I agree. Don't have children unless you have a healthy, satisfying, supportive relationship uh, that can take care of these children. And even beyond, it's just, a, I mean, friends and family too. Yeah. That... We, we have many, many mothers having children in this country who don't yeah. have that qualification or supportiveness. So that they, they're putting themselves into a very problematic situation yeah. and their children. And it gets passed on from generation to generation. Mm -hmm. So it's it's about being conscious of your choices. Yeah, yeah. There's got to be a questionnaire somewhere that um, that leads people through deciding whether to get married or not. It's like, do you guys agree on this? Do you agree on that? Do you agree on this? Do you agree on that? You know, if you don't agree on certain things, don't get married. And this is this would definitely be one of, <laughs> one of the things. It's it seems so obvious to me, but and that's why I laugh. Is like. You know, people should definitely have this conversation before they decide to have children together. Yeah. But for some reason, so many people don't. And I guess Jessica and James didn't think well, about <laughs> talking about it. Then this raises a recommendation that I have had and will continue to have is that uh, because of our longstanding uh, cultural practices in this country regarding children and, and how these practices conflict with what is best for children, we need to have uh, some uh, educational programs for, for example, uh, children in high school and college mm -hmm. uh, on uh, human development, uh, including uh, natural parenting. Yep. 
we, we need to literally teach our culture uh, for people who are prospective future children, uh, parents, yeah. uh, what, what the best choices are and even explain why what they see around them does not conform to what the best choices are. Yeah. So, I mean, th I think that needs to be, you know, what state and or government or federally funded yeah. to, to reach uh, a large majority of people who may have children in the future. Without that, people are just they're going to do what was done to them. Mm -hmm. That's the compulsion to repeat yep. the trauma. Uh, and they're going to do what's commonly practiced with their friends and family, like put your babies in cribs in another room and, yeah. and all the other stuff, that, you know, bottle feeding instead of breastfeeding. I mean, yeah. the, li the list goes on. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and I, I, I think that that should definitely be done in high school because not everyone reaches college. Um, but I, I think at the same time, it, it would probably be a class like sex ed where you had to have the, the parent or guardian sign off on the, on the student attending the class. Um, which kind of just quick uh, aside here, I, I've been trying to be involved with my son's um, um, schools uh, about this topic. I would attend their sessions where they would try to explain to parents what they're teaching and everything like that. And it's like, I want a copy of the uh, the textbook or whatever that they go through because I want to give direct feedback to the textbook authors about you know how they present circumcision and stuff like that because it's it's clearly so normalized and 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 you know made out to be okay and and um, all that. So you get a response. Uh, I've been back and forth a little bit, but I haven't gotten a solid, you know, here's the textbook or whatever. It, I would think that wouldn't be too hard to get a hold of, but. I'm sure you well know that they could cite studies that support their position. That's, <laughs> yeah. That, that's part of the problem. The studies yeah. are there. Yeah. Biased studies done by circumcised American men. Yeah. Yeah. But I've got to try, right? Um, so I, I, I'll send the studies, I'll give them the studies that I know about um, yeah. supporting, you know, my standpoint on it and all that and, and try to make them even, you know, just like I said before, baby steps and get them to make little changes that will hopefully lead on to bigger changes down the road. Um, you know, for example, I, there was a urology textbook, you know, from medical, you know, for medical schools. Um, I went through it and I just, you know, I, I took snippets of things that I had issues with and then laid out why I had issues with it and sent them sent it to I think seven of the eight editors of the book I found their names online and found out how to contact them and all that and I actually got responses from them saying yeah we got your your feedback thank you of course they didn't you know admit to any wrongdoing or anything but you know it, at least it got to them so yeah. well yeah uh, I appreciate your efforts thanks uh <clears throat> So co-parenting, uh, mother-child bond, which we talked about um, yep. a couple times already. Um, and there's a pedophilia side of this. Uh, some people, you know, I know there's people that are really hot about the topic of pedophilia. But um, a lot of people think that, you know, pedophilia is, is underlying this whole practice in the first place. But I, ha I came up with a, a theory um, <clears throat> about how this might actually even lead to more pedophilia. Because <clears throat> I often hear that uh, it's desirable for women's vaginas to be tight, right? Uh, some women get reconstructive surgery, whatever, to, to be tight for their, for their partners. Um, or they'll do their Kegels, for example. Well, if a man is missing half of his erogenous tissue or you know, a large amount of his erogenous tissue, what he has left is pressure because pressure is also a valuable thing for, for the penis, right? So <clears throat> I often hear that the idea that younger women have tighter vaginas just because they haven't had childbirth or whatever. So that would be just another reason for men to be attracted to younger women. But again, that's just a theory. Well, it, it, it's not something I have been involved with. Yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, we, we got plenty of good reasons to stop circumcising and, yeah. and we know 
the psychological uh, resistance to that is is uh, you know very difficult to uh, to deal with, and we, we just we just need to uh, be more persistent and spread the word, and as I said before, educate people before they become parents, and you know there, there's there's ways of you know, making progress here, and uh, you know I'm, I'm confident we will get there. It's a matter of when, not if. Okay. Yeah. I I agree. Uh, and then there's a relationship between doctors and patients. Um, I've become less and less trustworthy of doctors. Uh, and this is definitely one of the biggest issues that has made me less trustworthy of doctors, which is really sad because we kind of need to be able to trust doctors in order to um, get uh, treatment for conditions that might kill us or whatever, right? That, that's why uh, if I have a, you know, a serious problem, which I don't, thankfully, uh, get more than one opinion. Yeah. Yeah. Regardless of what the field of medicine is, uh, you know, certainly if, you, if it's going to in, potentially involve surgery, get more than one opinion. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, I sometimes, um, some people come to ask me, well, you know, I, I have phimosis or whatever. And, um, and my doctor saying, I need to get a circumcision. It's like, well, first of all, if they're calling a circumcision, then the, they, I, I think they're biased. <laughs> um, they should be calling it something like uh, prepucial amputation or prepucial plasty or, or postectomy or something. Um, and second of all, there is another way to deal with um, <clears throat> with that without completely removing the prepuce. Um, in fact, there is a conversation that just started yesterday on TikTok. Uh, a guy, guy that got cut, but it sounds like he didn't get a few uh, a full prepucial amputation. So but the word circumcision was used. So it didn't sound like it was a full prepucial amputation. Does, does that qualify as circumcision? I don't know. Uh, it sounds to me like he got more prepucial plasty, so he's still somewhat uh, intact there. Uh, he's happy that he got the surgery and all that, and he feels better, but anyways. Um, yeah, so I send people to other doctors to get other opinions. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then this affects the relationships between friends and family, as we, uh, as I've spoken before about, uh, you know, like the advocates for genital autonomy, uh, myself included. Some friends and family have cut me off because of yeah. of uh, my speaking out about this issue and trying to convince them not to you know, yeah. cut their okay. child. I mean, again, my my thought about that is uh, ask, you know, again, I repeat here a little bit, rather rather than you or any individual person uh, saying, look, I'd like to talk to you about something that's a little sensitive. And, uh, rather than get into an extended discussion or debate, uh, the question of are you open to new information is get, get that out there very soon. Yeah. And then ask them to watch a video or, or to go to a website. Yeah. You know, there's plenty of uh, websites opposing circumstances. The point is, then they don't make it personal. Well, yeah, it's it's not uh, put on you. Yeah, they can see that there's significant support for this position from professionals and others. Mm -hmm. So it, then when they come back to you. They know you're not just the sole person that's got this particular. Yeah. Uh, oh yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm saying as a strategy, that's what I suggest. Yeah. Yeah, and quite often my wife and I would, you know, take that strategy, but then they, you know, they would come back with um, arguments or whatever. It's like, well, you haven't even read all that, did you? Or you haven't actually watched all that, did you? And so we, we you know, it ends up being a back and forth anyways, and then they still get mad. <laughs> I, it, people will be people. It's, it's just something you're going to have to accept at a certain point sometimes. Well, we're all doing the best we can. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> So, uh, so unless there's anything else that you can think of about how this affects relationships between people, um, I'd like to just talk a little about a little bit about um, the other kinds, you know, the the non-male <laughs> um, general cutting. Yeah. Uh, well, we have a uh, a link on circumcision.org mm -hmm. that compares male and female general cutting. And uh, I refer people to that. It's 
it's in the right menu mm -hmm. on the website. And uh, that, that link uh, goes to a page that has 21 similarities between male and female genital. Okay, traits. so that's more than what your book says. Your book has 15 similarities, but yeah. yeah. So, so I, that will be in the public policy and debate section? Yeah, exactly, yeah. 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 Down near the bottom, I think it is, of that yeah. menu column. Yeah, uh, a lot of people are really I mean, they won't even, they, it's like they put covers, put their their hands over their ears whenever this comparison to female general cutting is brought up at all. Um, it's like, it's not the same at all. It's like, I'm trying to say it's exactly the same. It's just, you know, there's, ethically there's, there's it one, is. There's one, one key I want to uh, do call uh, to our attention here is that in societies where female general cutting is common, uh, virtually in all those societies, male genital cutting is common. Yeah. So, and and in, and in those societies, uh, for example, if the if the women aren't cut, uh, the men are less likely to marry them. Yeah. So there's a risk on on that. Yeah. So the point is, if if we want to get rid of one, we need yeah. to get rid of both. Yeah. Because one is is supporting the other. Yeah, uh, but that that that's a tough call. I mean, I mean, not a tough. It's 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 psychologically and culturally challenging uh, to try to stop these practices wherever they are. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, but uh, you know, we got to do what we can. Yeah. You know, if we save one baby or child from being cut, that is a a large victory. Yeah, consider that. Yep, and you don't see very many females speaking out against this practice when they are actually still living in those cultures. Um, from what I've seen, the, for the most part, the women that speak out against uh, general cutting of children are women that have somehow gotten away, you know, like left Somalia or, or, yeah. or Nigeria or wherever, and ended up in, say, the UK or whatever, where they are welcomed to speak their, their truth. Yeah. Right. Um, but there are there are some things in this that I was kind of wondering about. Um, so he said that FGM is performed under worse operating conditions. Well, in the United States, yeah, that's I mean it's it's become a surgical procedure. I don't I avoid the word the term medical procedure because it's, it's not medical. If there's not a medical indication, then it's not a medical procedure. It's just mm -hmm. a surgical procedure um, based in. Well, it's done by force on children. Yeah, and it's, it's based on on ritual, and it's not based in medicine. The other thing is they'll adopt cultural beliefs, like you know, for the boys who say, you're a man now, now that you're circumcised. You know, they'll, they'll have these beliefs and traditions you know, that are used to justify these practices. Yeah. Uh, and that's what go, goes with the territory. I mean, cultures have to adopt some kind of belief or justification for doing something so horrible. Yeah. So there's a denial on one side and adopting false beliefs on the other side. Um, there is uh, the Zosa tribe, though, in um, in Africa. They they perform this in a very horrible operating condition. I mean, they they're outside. They've got this white stuff, white powder, whatever, all over their bodies, and then they just they just go at it with a knife. Just you know, like, they have no idea how rusty the knife is. And, and then and then the the men um, sit in a hut for weeks or whatever until they heal. Uh, and they might die. Mm -hmm. um, so FGM has several forms and is typically much more severe. So um, I've heard of various, I mean, the, I've heard of other forms that end up cutting a lot more than just the, the prep use off. And I've also heard of cases where, you know, they just draw a drop of blood, um, even, um, Jay, he references his partner who um, thinks that he was circumcised, he's Jewish, um, but he still has a certain, a good bit of coverage on his penis. And I guess what happened was that the Moyle didn't see that there was enough of anything to cut. So it pretty much just draw, drew a drop button and stopped there. So, so there's, there are some, um, there's a variety of male genital mutilation practices as well. Um, 
the the prerequisite for marriage, which you were just referring to about FGM, um, uh, quite often I'll come across the, the argument, uh, I want my boy to get a blow job. <laughs> so there's there's beliefs, you know, here in the United States that the uh, that their boy won't be able to find a partner if they remain intact. So. Um, and FGM results in more apparent adverse effects. We know that that affects like birth, for example. Um, so yeah, there's no arguments there. Uh, and then FGM is performed on people of a wider range of ages. Um, so in the US it's primarily babies, but like in Turkey it's like older boys and in South Korea, uh, which I understand they got the whole practice from us back during the Korea war. Um, they also wait until the boys are older. Uh, Philippines, they do a different kind of cut. Um, they don't remove any tissue. I think they just do a cut and then pull it down and then sew it together or whatever. Um, I haven't seen any details about that, but that's what I've heard. Um, and again, that's also older boys. And then you've got like the Zosa tribe who, where they do it like at 15, 16, 17, 18 years old um, as a rite of passage into to manhood. So what, uh, you know, I, I don't, intend to have a competition between FGM and MGM, um, you know, saying one's worse than the other. I don't see how that helps anyone. Um, if we simply agree that it shouldn't be done, you know, non-consensual, non-therapeutic, it shouldn't, it shouldn't be done um, to people. Um, but what I do well, see, just like you were referring to, is that I see this like a weed. You don't pull, you know, if you have a three-limbed three -lay weed, three leaf weed, you don't just pull one one leaf of the weed. You get down there and pull the roots out, right? Listen, I just thought of a, another analogy here is that uh, there is some routine uh, genital cutting, female genital cutting going on in this country. Yep. It's called episiotomy. Yeah, that's true. It's unnecessary yeah. a large majority of the time, but it, it's custom with American obstetricians to do it. So uh, again, uh, it's, it's predictable. I mean, that's what we're seeing in other countries and, and, uh, and we're fooling ourselves if we think uh, this is not affecting some even limited uh, professional perspective on, on female genitals and, and how they should be treated. Yeah. Yep. I, I, I know one person that really is upset that she got an episiotomy herself. Yeah. So we, we certainly recommend that people seriously consider home birth. <laughs> you want to avoid some of the problems that can happen in the hospital. Yeah. Supposedly some of the birth centers are really good too, but um, I just called one earlier um, that has a birth center that is reopening since the pandemic is over and, and they're, news article they they brought up you know that they do circumcisions there and um so i called and complained and told them how i felt about it and all that but um but yeah supposedly birth centers could be a little bit more like home a little more relaxing and comfortable and, mm -hmm. and all that instead of the um being surrounded by beep beep boop boop beep <laughs> and you know having all these people try to rush you through the process and all that i oh. I wish there was some other way to, to address that. And um, because you know, doctors and nurses, they're, you know, they're being pressured by the higher ups to, you know, be efficient. So they keep costs down and, and insurance companies, I'm sure too, they don't want to pay out any more than they have to. So they're probably applying pressure to, you know, speed things up. Yeah, it's important to consider all these factors. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. May we conclude soon? Yes, uh, that was that was pretty much the end of the, the things I wanted to cover with you, Ron. Um, excellent, excellent. So once again, thank you, thank you, thank you. I really appreciate what you what you have done in the past decades. <laughs> um, Thanks to do it, and also appreciate your providing me the opportunity to uh, to participate here. My pleasure, absolutely my pleasure. Okay, I'm going to stop the recording then. Um, Thank you all for watching and uh, 
look out for uh, in the future for my episodes once I get some time to compile them. <laughs>